Welcome to Fintech Impact. This podcast is an exploration of the financial technology world, interviewing different fintech entrepreneurs about what they do, their story, and what their impact is on consumers, incumbents, and the industry as a whole. Here's your host, award-winning financial planner, university lecturer, and writer, Jason Pereira. Hello, and welcome to Fintech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. So for those of you who may have noticed, there was a week off in between the last two episodes. That's just because of all the various conferences I was traveling to, couldn't manage to squeeze another one in there. So before we get started, one piece of housekeeping, as mentioned before, I am a director of the Individual Finance and Insurance Decision Center, and we have our annual conference coming up on November 6th in Burlington at the Michael G. DeGroote School of Business of Master University. Tickets are still available. You can see the notice on my LinkedIn page. Today on the show, I have Paul Demaray III, chairman of Portage Ventures. Now, yes, I have had Portage Ventures on before and recently. I recently met Paul at a conference in Whistler and could not pass up the opportunity to get him to speak on this show. So with that, here's Paul Demaray III. Hello, Paul. Hello. Thank you for taking the time today. Thank you. Very much appreciate it. So Paul Demaray III, tell us about uh, Portage. Portage is one of the world's leading financial services innovation investment funds. So uh, we invest in fintech globally. We are focused on direct-to-consumer business models, but also B2B, but very focused on three verticals, insure tech, personal finance, and wealth management. Those are verticals that we feel we know better than most other funds out there and uh, are dedicated to investing in those. Excellent. So we're going to jump into that in a minute, but give me your history on what was the impetus for starting the company. The impetus on starting the company was a deep belief that financial advice is in the best interest of Canadians. And ultimately did a whole bunch of surveys on the value of advice and came up with the, and concluded that Canadians that are advised end up retiring with 2.9 times more assets than Canadians that are unadvised. We then saw that a large amount of Canadians, despite that, are unadvised. And what we concluded was that one of the reasons why they were unadvised is that the traditional advice channels don't serve those customers, sometimes because those customers don't have enough assets Mm -hmm. to make it worthwhile for financial advisors to serve them. And sometimes those customers just fundamentally believe that advice is too expensive or don't trust advice. And traditionally come packaged with some sort of sale. So it's clouded by that. It's clouded by that. And so ultimately what we decided is that there are other channels that can be used to bring more advice to uh, Canadians, i.e. growing the pie Mm -hmm. of people that are advised and accessing segments of the population that that historically were never accessed by the Power Financial Group. That is where Portage began. Mm -hmm. And from there, we decided that this was actually possible across many other products and financial services. And so we launched an investment vehicle dedicated to the theme of figuring out and finding entrepreneurs that have figured out pain points in consumers' financial journeys and build companies to solve those pain points. It brings up an interesting point because uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with XYPN in the U.S., but they're very much built a model around advisors servicing clients on a retainer basis, yeah. right? And when you have low overhead and you're not dealing with the regulatory burden, you can deliver that kind of service at a much lower monthly, lower monthly cost. And they kind of identify the, kind of the three markets that they said. There's the traditionally serviced market, which we clearly know is addressed. Then there's the one that can be serviced on a retainer-based model. And then there's the one that you can't really find a way to do that. Yeah. But that being said, some of the solutions you guys have invested in have definitely taken that to a different level. I mean, while simple, your large, one of your larger investments, one dollar is all yeah. it takes, right? So thank you for helping enable Canadians to be able to do that. Well, simple. Or even things like Albert in the United States, it's, it's basically yeah. a financial plan. It'll be some people actually out there don't even have financial assets to invest. Some, Absolutely. many people are just living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. Those are people that will tend to not have access to any advice. In fact, we'll often have negative advice where the banks will be trying to push products on them, often credit products. Yeah. They'll be subject to a lot of overdraft fees. Yeah. Basically things that the financial institutions put in to kind of maximize profitability off of clients that often are the least well-equipped yeah. to face those types of things. There's been studies done to show that oftentimes that the free accounts are the ones that end up costing uh, poorer clients the most because of all the overdraft fees. Exactly. And so what Albert does, which is this fantastic platform, is as a choose in a choose what you pay model, Mm -hmm. i.e. the consumer is allowed to pay Albert for its advice, whatever the consumer wants to pay. Mm -hmm. Albert basically helps that consumer save money 
in a variety of different ways from helping them kind of avoid the overdraft fees to advising them that, hey, you know, maybe you should go to restaurants a little less often, <laughs> you know, just yeah, just really kind of focus Based on fundamental what things. is yeah. best for that customer. Absolutely. So I want to wind the clock back a minute because the parent company of, of Portage is, yeah. uh, is Power Financial Corporation, which yes. is a large giant in Canada owning various uh, financial entities, insurance and investment. So what you're doing here, and I said this to you when we first met, yeah. I have just the utmost respect for what, you've, what you're doing here because it's really hard for a traditional business to incubate different businesses that could disrupt its, its entire uh, purpose for being. Yeah. So the fact that you're willing to disrupt from within, I find incredibly, yeah. incredibly uh, forward thinking. So can you tell me about the challenges maybe that you encountered with any kind of pushback or, or resistance uh, with traditional lines of business thus yeah. far? Fantastic. So. Power Financial is the largest investor in Portage. Portage actually has many outside investors enough, as well. Yeah. But Power Financial owns the general partnership of yes. Portage. One of the keys in thinking about kind of internal disruption, external disruption, is having a deep understanding of segmentation. And what we found is that when you look at Canadian wealth as an example, 80% of investable assets in Canada are controlled by the bank channel. The bank channel started. <laughs> basically controls $3.2 billion of kind of assets or somewhere a little bit above $3 billion of assets. What's interesting about that channel is that one third of those assets are held in cash. That is a terrible is, oh, asset wow. allocation choice for people. But it's in the bank's interest to encourage people to have cash in their accounts. So they can lend out and make money out. And so ultimately, when you look at that, that is an incredible target for anybody looking to enter the system. And so if you look at Wealth Simple as the perfect example, a majority of the assets coming on to the Wealth Simple platform are assets that are owned by first-time investors that have never invested before or clearly never had real financial advice before and are transferring cash deposits into an investment product. You can call that disruption, you can call that whatever you want, but ultimately the way I see it is that you're simply growing the size of the population that is being advised. Mm -hmm. You're not necessarily disrupting in an aggressive kind of way. When you look at the Wealth Simple for Advisors platform, that is in fact in many ways more disruptive than our B2B platform because the B2C platform goes direct to consumers, often mm -hmm. consumers that are not served. The B2B platform is empowering advisors to significantly increase the productivity of their franchise and empowering advisors to serve smaller clients in a more effective way. That, I think, is ultimately disruptive in that advisors that don't adopt new technologies and enhance their productivity and kind of go to a world where they used to serve everybody in an okay way exactly. will get disrupted by advisors that are razor focused on what is their value proposition, what is the customer segment they're looking to serve, and leverage outside technology to serve segments that they may not be best to serve. Absolutely. And I've often said when talking to other advisors, I just, I don't understand this sort of belief that, or this thinking that we are somehow different than every other business in the world, right? You have to work on efficiencies constantly. You have to, you have to automate processes. Otherwise, you will get crushed by other competitors. So I think it's, we've gotten away with not doing that for a long time. That's not the future. So in general, like the experience of being largely funded by a bigger company and then going out and talking to a lot of small startups, what was the reception like from the startup community in general? Very good because we come as value added investors. You know, not only do we have a track record as a family of being extremely entrepreneurial, I mean, we are an entrepreneurial family by nature. And so I think we were able to relate to entrepreneurs way more than the big corporate that is, you know, truly just, you know, corporate animal. No one wants to be bought by a bank. <laughs> or, yeah. or a lot of the traditional VCs that don't really understand financial services, and many of whom are, are not as entrepreneurial as we are. So ultimately, the entrepreneurial nature of our team, with people like Adam Fileski having founded Horizon ZTF and been the CEO of that for 10 years, or Nick Hungerford, who built the leading robo-advisor in England, or Stefan Klee, who was the CFO of ING Direct for basically its entire history, that is a team that speaks to entrepreneurs because it's a team that has scaled businesses, that has built businesses, that has taken risks and has owned those risks. And that is not something that a lot of people out there can speak to.
So you mentioned a couple of uh, plays already. Do you think that were, were bigger focus and bigger help the Canadians? So the Alberts and the Well Simples of the world. What other ones? I mean, I hate to ask you to pick your favorite child of the group, uh, and that's not what I'm asking here. But what other areas do you think exploit that kind of gap that is not being serviced right now? You know, Barwell. Yeah. Uh, Barwell, you know, started as a B two C kind of lending platform, added a free credit score product to its offering, and now is adding a credit coach. You know, where if you have a low credit score, you can go to Borrowell and get credit coaching to improve your balance sheet, which ultimately a lot of Canadians suffer from having a lot of debt. And having someone that can coach you through how to improve your credit score is a great service. That would be one example. Dialogue, our telemedicine platform, mm-hmm. giving access to Canadians to telemedicine services at the click of a button through their employer is an incredible service in that it saves people countless hours of waiting in emergency rooms by giving them direct access to uh, medical care. And so there are plenty of different solutions we've launched. Nesto, which is our digital mortgage solution. It's one of the first platforms in the country where you can get a mortgage by using an entirely digital application. Painful process normally, yeah. And and we deliver some of the lowest rate mortgages in the country. Fantastic. You know, that is extremely attractive. It makes the whole mortgage application transparent, clear. It's a real value add for Canadians. Absolutely. So And all of these tools can be used by advisors. Absolutely. <laughs> Don't I know it? So and this is an interesting question. The when you start working with these companies, what degree of freedom do you leave the management team with? Total uh, freedom. Total freedom. And this total is freedom. again, that was a setup because I'm aware of it. And this is the interesting thing because I find that a lot of times there are concerns towards you know big money players coming in and then starting to lead the way and putting them on a treadmill they don't want to go. You seem to have a real hands off approach altogether. Total. You know, it's interesting because I wouldn't call it a hands off approach because I'm not sure any of the entrepreneurs we're involved with would call us hands off. Fair enough. Um, but I'd say we're hands on in, in that we try and be experts in their business and we try and learn as much as we can from them to be value added investors. When it comes to thinking about what is right for the customer, what is right for the company, we tend to really empower the CEO to make those decisions. And ultimately, what we found is that just like we understand financial services well, many of these CEOs understand how a consumer interacts with financial services better than we do. And so we'll often understand the product construction to a depth that is very good. We won't necessarily be as good as these management teams in understanding how does a consumer actually want to consume that product? Yeah, because they have the client-facing experience. They have the data coming back from all of that. Exactly. And the perfect example of that is the Welt Simple black free airport lounge access. <laughs> I yep. would say the entire Portage team basically was like, you know, this is crazy. You know, who wants airport lounge access with their investment account? We've never heard of this. I get with my credit card. but <laughs> and, yep. and, and the reality is that it's one of the favorite features that consumers have with the Weld Simple Black account. Yeah. And we never would have predicted that. Mm-hmm. But the Weld Simple team is much more in touch with consumer needs than what we are. Yeah. And that's why we empower these management teams. It's that they know their customers best. Absolutely. That makes sense. I, mean, the, I think there's always like a set of fear when the big check comes in. And you know, there's, there's, right, there's right, lots of stories out there about that happening where the meddling just becomes too much and the teams walk away. You've clearly never had that experience from what I've seen thus far. And, and everyone I've talked to who's in that part of the family is just very happy with being yeah. with you. If I keep on going through your list of companes I've interviewed, at some point we get to start asking for sponsorship of this pod. <laughs> <laughs> that is a joke. Uh, but um, the, you mentioned different lines of business. Are there any areas right now that you feel are you're deficient in or you're focusing on going forward or that you can at least speak to without giving away what you're working on? I think the world of payments is very interesting for us. I Mm. mean, Canada has an antiquated payment system. I'd say we're falling behind as a country uh, relative to what is available elsewhere. Mm -hmm. It's a tightly controlled world by the banks. I think it is an area where as a country, I think we need to ask ourselves, you know, are we... As consumers, are we really willing to be so far behind? And does it make sense that it takes multiple days to clear kind of money transfers? Does the friction in the system make sense? And how much leakage is taking place as a result of that friction? And I think we need to ask ourselves as a country, you know, is this something that we really want? Or do we want to evolve to a more kind of modern system 
where there's less leakage, more real-time transactions, better consumer products ultimately. Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, when I teach and I have students come up to me and talk about you know, what they've experienced in other countries and you know, they open up, and invariably if they're from China, they open up WeChat and they're like, I can send money right now and it'll be there in a second. I'm like, I know, and it's painful to me to see that like, yes. not happening here. And you know, I've heard all the stories about the infrastructure reasons. So I agree with you. I think that that is an, an area that's ripe for disruption. I mean, you look at, I think Apple kind of fired a shot across the bow with their Apple Pay yeah. ability to keep cash on on your actual card. I mean, they're thinking thinking that we're going to be able to send money using Apple as a backstop for security. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's the big trade-off in Canada. People seem to take a lot of comfort in our large institutions. And I feel like we pay a very high price yeah. uh, in order to have that kind of comfort level. So you've recently made some further that, I guess, you've made some investment in blockchain plays. Can you tell me how you're kind of seeing yeah. that entire emerging field? Blockchain is an emerging and speculative field. Ultimately, so, yeah. right now, it is very uncertain what the ultimate uses of blockchain will be. We have uh, sponsored a company that helped launch the EOS protocol, EOS Canada, and now I believe it re renamed itself Defuse. I missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ultimately, we believe that blockchain has the potential uh -huh. to be transformative for certain kind of parts of the financial ecosystem. You know, blockchain as a way to track kind of smart contracts is very interesting. Blockchain as a tool within a kind of corporation is very interesting. We are trying to be as smart as possible on the subject by launching companies like Defuse EOS Canada and investing in funds that focus on blockchain type solutions to make sure that we will be a very early adopter when true commercial opportunities kind of emerge. You're in the uh, field, you're getting that experience, you get an understanding. We're in the field, recognize that. we're getting the experience. One thing is for certain is that there is a wave of extraordinarily talented people Absolutely. leaving their existing jobs to launch solutions in blockchain type companies and applications. That is a wave that should not be ignored because when a lot of people migrate towards a certain type of you know, business, it creates a network effect mm -hmm. and network effects, you know, if they reach a certain scale are very hard to stop. So one of the areas that you've made recent investments in through uh, Quovo specifically is yes. in the right of uh, basically in, in data management and data yeah. access. And that's been a big hurdle in Canada specifically around yes. uh, banks not wanting to free up said data. Talk to me about what that means to you as a company yeah. altogether. Yeah. So we believe aggregation is the future financial advice, uh, period. I think consumers having access to their data, consumers owning their data is absolutely critical for proper financial planning. It's impossible Even for you. Even right. I mean, it's, I, should, it, I should own it. It's, it's impossible for anybody to produce a proper financial plan without having a full picture of a consumer situation. Absolutely. And the cost and the hurdle of having to get all that data in a kind of, you know, piecemeal kind of way rather than an aggregated format is, again, a very high frictional cost and a barrier to advice, or at least a barrier to good advice. And so we believe that platforms like Quovo, Plaid, Flinks in Canada are all part of the future of kind of financial advice and will form an integral part of that. In Europe, it's been legislated that banks need to be open and need to give people access to it's their data. It's not figured out how yet, but yes, it's, it's, it's happening. The U.S., the sheer competitive nature of that yeah. market has made it that banks have opened up. Given that Canada is a much less competitive market, the large financial institutions have been able to kind of keep their walls up mm -hmm. and kind of have shared data much less. Yeah. But I believe that the future will be aggregated accounts. And I think that that is something that will come. It is just extremely important that it not come in a siloed approach where only RBC or yes. only CIBC have access to their client data because ultimately the way that will be used will likely not end up being in the no. customer's best interest. No, I mean, we already have the right to it under certain legislation and I find it, I always find it amusing that the banks will say that if you use your passcode for anything to do with data aggregation that you void your fraud protection but the meanwhile, hey, we have a data aggregator, feed us your information yeah. and th those kinds of silos just drive me insane. Yeah. Although it's important to recognize that the banks invest a lot in their clients. The banks cannot be liable for what happens outside of their walls. Agreed. And so it's the same thing in the payment ecosystem. You know, you can't expect the banks to shoulder the bill for the entire yeah. payment infrastructure 
and make it accessible to everybody. I think in many of these scenarios, we just need better policy Absolutely. that is fair to the banks and fair to everybody else. And I agree with that. I mean, the reality is, is, is my firm belief, again, is that we should have rights to data that are that is ours. However, yes, we have to make sure that the parties involved are not, you know, taking on liability that's unmerited because right. of it. And, you know, when I look in, I just got back from the FPA conference in the U.S., and I look at some of the financial planning software has been able to do with great data access that they have down there. And the ability that they're able to go from zero to fully implemented planning like that, it's, it's incredible to me. And I think that's that's generation one, right? Yeah. I, I look at the future and think to myself, you know, a true financial plan is something that updates with every expense that I take, right? So I went to the coffee shop. That gets slotted under my budget for that coffee shop. Did that actually stay within the bounds of what I'm supposed to be doing every month? If I start to go completely offside, the advisor gets a real-time push of that. So that's an exciting future I look forward to. <laughs> but uh, And I thank you for, for some investments that are helping make that happen. So... You do have a lot of plays. Like, how many total investments have you made at the date, roughly? Over 30 today. Over 30. Wow. And that places you very high up on the list in terms of the fintech space altogether. Yeah, we're, we're one of the most active funds in the world. Wow. That's, um, and not, not that it's been how long now? How many years? Three years. Three years to go from zero to one of the most active yeah. funds in the world. Wow. Well done. Now, I mean, obviously, there's probably conversation about roll up plays or interoperation yeah. interoper- inter- between these companies. Uh, is this still to really be talking about that, or are those conversations happening? No, you, you know, it's interesting because we have one of the first cases of collaboration between companies taking place right now, mm-hmm. where through your Coho spending card, yes. spending app, you can now uh, open a Wealth Simple Savings account. So that is one of the first collaborations we've launched. Over a thousand Coho users have opened accounts on Wealth Simple. That's a fantastic um, integration because they just speak to each other so perfectly. They, they, they speak to each other yeah. so perfectly. And so that is the first example of what is to come. Our belief is that fintech collaborating with fintech is going to be an essential part of the kind of future financial lives of our customer base. Absolutely. Uh, as well as fintech partnering with traditional companies. You know, National Bank has partnered with Breed Life, our new direct life company. We have uh, multiple partnerships with Equitable Bank. All of these players are players that are open for business and are very easy companies for the fintech ecosystem to partner with. You mentioned two uh, companies there that aren't actually tied into your mother company. No. That's interesting to me because so clearly, what's is it just fear motivating them on their end? Is it a recognition that they are better off partnering and trying to do it in-house? What do you think is, is happening in their heads? They have an incredible opportunity ahead of them. They do not have the brick-and-mortar network mm-hmm. that saddle a lot of larger banks across North America uh, with significant legacy costs and infrastructure. Mm-hmm. And so an equitable that is one of the truly kind of disruptive banks in Canada has an incredible opportunity to grow their customer base, grow their reach by partnering with fintech. A national bank, same thing, it's very strong presence in Quebec, but not that present in the rest of the country. An incredible opportunity to partner with, with fintech and to build businesses outside of their kind of core geography. And if you look at financial services institutions globally, they often partner with fintech to go after geographies and segments that they're not currently present in. So you look at Standard Chartered building a digital bank in Africa. You you look at a DBS in Singapore building a digital bank in India. You look at BNP Paribas built a digital bank in Germany. There are huge opportunities to go after new geographies, new customer segments via disruptive platforms outside of your core markets. And it's interesting because in Canada, we've had that experience in the past. We've had the ING Directs, we've had the allied banks, but you know, invariably, most of them ended up selling out to a larger player. Yeah. And I often sit back and think about something where Kurtzwill said about innovation or an idea is not bad, sometimes it's just the timing that doesn't work. Yes. I look at the generational timing that's happening now and, and people's ease of comfort and use with the internet. I think, yeah, maybe that was generation one. Generation two is people who are opting in to be digital as opposed to meet face-to-face. I mean, even in my practice, when I offered, when I set up an online scheduling system and offered the option for virtual meetings, I figured, yes, the younger ones would take it, the older ones would still want to meet face-to-face. I was staggered by the number of older ones, who older clients who basically just realized, hey, I would rather absolutely be sitting in my pajamas at home having this meeting than driving into downtown Toronto. So that kind of acceptance of the digital world, I think the next round of, of online banks are going to be a serious threat to Canadian institutions that are that are already established. So it's in the fact that, you know, maybe, and it doesn't have to be, as you pointed out, it doesn't have to be 
completely new players. You have some established ones who, just like you said, new geographies. They can basically go from Quebec to the rest of Canada online and start competing from day one. So it's it's an exciting time. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, one of the things you said to me when we first met was you really see this as kind of a generational opportunity. Do you want to speak to why it makes you feel that way? Yeah. I mean, I believe that fintech is a generational investment opportunity because I think today there are major changes taking place not only in actual technology, but in financial services that at their confluence creates an incredible opportunity. Changes in technology are mass availability of infrastructure Mm -hmm. that used to cost a fortune to build and had to be built by each company individually, now available for rent. So things like Amazon Web Services, extraordinarily enabling. Social media. Social media as a client acquisition tool is fantastic because it is something that could be done at a very small scale Mm -hmm. or at a very large scale Uh, versus historically where you had to use traditional media channels, it was always a big bang. And so the risk reward of doing something wrong was enormous. Enormous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the wrong TV commercial was a huge. Exactly. Setback. Versus in social media, you could trial a whole bunch of yeah. things. You could segment much better. E testing, all kinds. And of acquire things. customers way more efficiently at a way lower risk than what was historically the case. And then finally, the rewards to taking that risk reward, the rewards to the fact that being an entrepreneur costs less today than ever before are far greater because the amount of capital investing in fintech globally. In terms of trends that are impacting financial services, which I believe make this moment fantastic, is one, the regulators. Mm -hmm. In many cases around the world, you're seeing regulators move from a purely prudential role to a world where they really care about customer fairness and customer outcomes and treating customers fairly. You've seen it with RDR in the UK. You've seen it with the fiduciary rules in the US. Mm -hmm. You see it with CRM too in Canada. Regulators care about the consumer and want them to be advised in ways that make sense. Financial institutions, trust in financial institutions was eroded by the financial crisis. And so that creates a real opportunity. And then incumbent financial institutions are saddled with legacy systems that are very hard to update, which gives them a, a challenge and a hurdle to overcome in order to offer similar quality services that some of these fintechs do. And it's interesting, I mean, that culmination of so many trends there, including you know, mobile, mobile connectivity, and you know, the old saying about uh, Amazon getting everybody used to getting everything instantly, and Apple making everything beautiful. Yeah. Now we expect that from everything. Yes. Uh, you know, the banks, in my opinion, or financial institutions, used to kick the can down the road on infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, hugely kick it down. It's, it's, it's almost, you know, I remember, being back at Gosha back in the early 2000s and seeing monochromatic screens in back office departments and wondering what was that. But now you can't do that anymore because, frankly, someone's coming to eat your lunch if you do. So do you see, I mean, at this point, I think we're at a very early stage. I mean, you must be looking towards an age or, or a time in the future where you start to see some some, some, some roll-ups or some M- some M&A activity within these different verticals themselves. Is that something you think you're on the horizon, near horizon, or do you think it's far off? Absolutely. If you look at our insurance platform in Germany, Clark, Clark has started buying insurance advisor books of businesses and digitizing them. If you look at, you know, well, well simple. I mean, we bought Excellent. share we bought share owner. That was basically an acquisition. Which of, I think makes you the only vertically integrated robo advisor ever seen. Which makes us the only vertically integrated robo advisor in Canada. Okay. Some in the US have kind of done parts of integration, but yeah. we are definitely the only ones in Canada, which gives us a major advantage in Canada. And I think across our portfolio, especially across our portfolio of more mature startups, you will see uh, M&A activity, whether it be buying legacy books of business in our German uh, mm-hmm. insurance distribution platform, or well, simple buying uh, add-on services that mm-hmm. they could kind of cross-sell to our customer base or to improve customer outcomes and improve the customer kind of experience, you are going to see, you know, more and more of this. So what's the, if you could change one thing about everything going on right now, whether it be in the industry or in your own companies, what's the biggest wish you have right now? The biggest wish I had is we could flick a switch and have modern back office systems in every business that we own. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, that's, uh, yes, that's, that's right up there with my list of biggest wishes in my business. Oh my goodness. If only. Yeah. Uh, no, it's going to be a long haul for that one. So um, coming up to the half hour mark, which I usually start to uh, cut off around here, but this has been great. The one question I always ask before we finish up is what excites you most about the opportunity, the space, what you're working on? What gets you up out of, out of bed this morning related to Portage? The people. Yeah. You know, the people on our team are amazing. The entrepreneurs we work with are inspiring. Yeah. The opportunity to improve the financial lives of people across Canada get me extremely motivated. And I honestly think that we now have over 100,000 clients of Wealth Simple. I feel that we are having a positive impact on all of those people's lives. And that gets me very excited. In the same way that, you know, we have a million customers at, a, at Investors Group and we have, God knows, 40 million customers globally at Great mm -hmm. West Life Co. These are very kind of exciting platforms and our ability to have an impact on the world for the positive is something that excites me a lot. It's interesting because you have, it's, it's such an interesting dichotomy that you deal with. You have one foot in, in this new world of hard charging entrepreneurs and you have the established player thing. And I got to say, it's got to be quite the cultural change to go back and forth between those because I've seen it too. I mean, I've sat down with many entrepreneurs you've dealt with and many others and you get an energy. You know, you get energy just being around them. You want to you wanna do more and do better because of it, too. And um, interestingly enough, and I'll share some feedback I get from teaching my class. I actually, when I teach at York, I have this one investment competition. And it's unlike any investment competition you do in any other school. Because I, in my opinion, the investment competitions teach the wrong lesson. Yeah. They teach the, how do I make as much money as possible in this semester by taking the biggest risks in order to win this contest, which is just not the way we should be doing things. So I have all these students put at least one dollar in Wealth Simple. I recommend ten, but I take no liability for losses over the course. And I basically say, look, I want you to understand how easy and how boring this is. And I invariably get two types of feedback. The vast majority of feedback is, you know what? This took away the fear I had about getting started. This took away the belief that I couldn't do this or that it was super complicated and that I had to pay constant attention to it and all this stuff yeah. and showed me that, wow, this is really easy. And then you have the ones who actually want to think that they're going to be the next Warren Buffett. They're like, no, no, this isn't good enough for me. I want to be doing this, that, and the other thing. Well, you know what? Um, it's It's been a very, like you said, you, that entire reduce, reduction of friction has been a big help in these people's minds already. Yeah. yeah. You know what? I'm, I'm a believer. Yeah, definitely so. And I can see that from the various companies you're, you're investing in. So thank you for your time and thank you for everything you're doing because, frankly, I know that I'm going to benefit from myself and my own practice. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So that was my interview with Paul Demaray. I hope you enjoyed that. They're clearly working on a lot of very interesting deals, and I'm very interested to see how this all pans out in the future. Until next time, I'm Jason Pereira. And as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever it is you get your podcasts. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.co.